Thank you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is Zhang Xuan from Han Yi Fund. And uh, don't be scared about the technical title. So it's basically it's a review from the perspective of the method of Chinese production. So here you see, it's maybe the most common and the most troublesome problem when you you will face when you design a Chinese typeface is that it's simple. We just have too many characters. So based on the latest national standard of China, we have more than seventy thousand characters which is insane. Yeah. And so for centuries, all the Chinese type designers has working for the same goal. We want it to make it good, and we want to make it quick. So about 2000 years ago, we have this book named Shuo Wen Jie Zi, and it's basically on the explanation of the Chinese characters. It explains everything, the meaning of the characters, and how it should be pronounced, and how it should be composed. So in this book, we have six main category of the Chinese type. And it also, the, for the first four of them, it's also the composing method of, of comp making the Chinese characters. For pictograms, it's simple. If you want the characters of the sum, you just draw the sum. So for the simple ideograms, it's also easy to understand. Well, one stroke means one, and two strokes means two, and three strokes means three. So, but these simple characters, they are only the minority of the Chinese character sets. So there are only like 300 characters, and for the most part of the Chinese characters, they are compound characters. And among them, the phonocinematic compound is the majority of them. It takes about 90% of the Chinese characters. Well, it's, uh, it's so long, it's like the word you're going to see in a health report, but uh, well, it's not that hard. So here, I can explain it. So, as the left, we see a uh, Chinese character means fish. So, we use it as a cinematic, and uh, that's the meaning of the, the, the new characters. And uh, we just borrow this phonetic part of the the Chinese characters Li, it, it's pronounced as Li. So we combine them together, then we get the characters means a fish named Li. Quite simple, right? So I think uh, currently you got all the knowledge you need to, pro to start your business pro producing some Japanese souvenir. There's a name table of different fishes. <laughs> so as you see, we are reusing the component of the fish again and again. Yeah, that's the red one. So people must be thinking about the method about building the, the characters from components. It's pretty early. This is a British missionary named Samuel Dyer who understood Chinese and who want to print the Holy Bible in China. So he started thinking about uh, we can make in some metal types from, from the components. And it was the French punch cutter uh, named Lu Kong. Well, I don't know if I pronounce it right. But that's how the metal types look. But due to many physical limitations of the metal types, it doesn't look very good, even by that, that time. But it is worth a try. It, uh, it is a good method to reuse a component again and again in this, in, in the component, uh, in the character type designs. So here you see is a component list from Dido Foundry. So currently we know the component feature has become an essential part of a type editors, no matter what it is, glyphs, RoboFonts, and FontLab. And you even have some more convenient functions like the interpolation in place. Thank you for all the developers. But for a language, for a script like Chinese, which have too many characters, which is, so I think which is most important is for the designers to quickly find the components and place it where it should be. So you, when you look at the component list from Dido Foundry, by that time it requires the skills of very proficient workers to, look, uh, to find the component 
and place it, place, uh, combine them together. So here you see it's an in-house software by Hain Founts. So when you are editing a characters, it will automatically display all the characters containing the same component with it. So you can quickly choose to, well, try to borrow some components from the other characters or to reuse the component you are satisfied with and in other characters. And it's also not limited only on the semantic components, which is also known as radicals in China. So we can also do it to the phonetic components, so it, which um, is very convenient. But somehow, it is speed up the, the, the steps that uh, you're, the step you're looking into certain components. But some, on the details, uh, on the drawings of the outline, it still requires a lot of work. So could we make it even faster? Yeah, we think about uh, if the computers could learn to write just like a human does. Uh, thanks for the latest uh, OCR technologies, and uh, the, now the computer can recognize the, the bitmap of the Chinese character somehow. So we can move to the next step, we can force the computer to learn to write. So here you see is a, is a result of automatic generation by the style learning of handwriting from Beijing University. So in the upper sample, you see we have some handwritten characters, but we have a lot of missing glyphs, so they just fall back into the, some other serif type. But with a small set of the Chinese characters, we can learn the style of writing and generate the rest of it just singly by push a button. Most of the main foundries has done the same things. So this is a result of a highest handwriting learning technology. So uh, the upper sample is the original drawings from, from the writers. And we took a subset of the other glyphs and we tried to regenerate the this glyphs and uh, try to learn the style. And uh, it's not perfect, but I think it's, it's come really close. But somehow, it's, it's not a flawless system. Because the style learning is based on a bitmap, so it's, re it's generated the bitmap and converted into outlines. So the, the quality of the outline is not good enough for text type, especially. And also, we find it's a problem. We humans, we don't recognize the Chinese characters by the pixels. I, I don't know this word because there's a pixel here, a pixel here. It's not that way. So what happens when the native speakers recognize the word? So we know the, we know the, the characters was composed by different, different strokes. We know where it be, should be properly placed. We know where to start and how the stroke should look like. We want the computer to recognize the characters just like we do. So is there a technology that allows computers to do that? So we have some inspirations from Metafont. So what does Metafont do? So in Metafont, it, uh, it describes the stroke uh, it describes the, the, the letters with strokes and with the trails of the stroke and also defines some, some element on the strokes like the width and the angle and the X height, the capital height. So that's where we got the inspirations and thank you for uh, Professor Dana Knus and uh, well, who is known as Gao De Na in, in China. Yeah, that's how you pronounce his name in Chinese. So that's exactly what we want. So we start our parametric model. We try to build the outline from the skeleton. The skeleton is a very important part in Chinese characters. It means the structure of the characters and it tells us where the stroke should be. And we should define the style of the strokes, just like Midafant. How do we do that? So basically, in the sample of a single horizontal bar, we define the beginning, 
the stern, and also the ending. So if we have a round beginning and a round ending, we have a round stroke. If we design a flare in the beginning and the end, we got a, well, like an old style serif stroke. If we have very thin stern and we have a thin beginning and a, the distinct the triangle shape ending, so we get a stroke from the serif type. So this is simple for a horizontal bar. But for some strokes, it could be really complicated. So here we see a single beginning, three turnings, and a very complete, uh, very complicated ending hook. But somehow, uh, you see the first turning and the third turning, they're the same. So with a parametric control, we can make the, them exactly the same, even precise than the human. So based on this, we can build the outlines. So basically, if we just apply the weight to the width, so we get the very simple sensor for all the Haiti style for Chinese. So we have the weight axis for variable fonts. As we see, the style is controlled with a parameter, so we can make it interpolatable. It's perfectly linear. So it's a very it's totally compatible with a uh, with a variable font. Of course, with a with a controller of parameter, we can make it linear. We can also make it nonlinear, which requires extra design spaces. But that's another story. So, we made some demo tests on the on the website access practice. Also, the named instance. So the important thing is we, we have a single weight access demo, and uh, but the, the outline was completely generated from the parameter control, and now it's a variable, harasho. But some people might doubt that uh, it sounds like a, an advanced level of the stroke panel in Illustrator. You just, uh, you just define the shape of the beginning and the end and you apply the width. So it might only work on the, the light weight. So in some heavy weight, it's gonna look like a fox spot font. So every strokes will, will connect together and it's not legible, but it's not that. We can not only control the the parameter of the strokes, we can also control the negative spaces. So in extreme weight for the characters, it controls both the stroke width and the negative stroke width, negative space width. So it's a complicated mechanism between the strokes and the negative spaces. So instead of a games of the designers, it's more like a game of the designers, which is also fun. Of course, we can also use parameters to control the, control the skeleton. So if we just uh, squeeze the skeleton so we can get a condensed shape, so we get the width axis for the, for the font. So, but we can also, yeah, we can also move the center part of the, for the Chinese characters, move it upside down and uh, up and down so we have the visual center height axis. So basically you can, any the control you can imagine, the width, the height, the body size, even some distinct features in Chinese like a zhonggong, we can control it with parameters. It's very convenient. So now we come to the key part of it. So where do we get the skeleton to play with? So actually we have been working for decades on the outline drawing for Chinese characters. And uh, now we are introducing a new system and uh, it's not reasonable for we ask the, the designers to redraw the skeleton and regenerate everything. It's, it just doesn't do. So based on the OCR technology we have already int introduced for an outline which has all the overlaps removed, we can reconstruct it into into separate strokes, and we found the position of the strokes, and we get the skeleton data. 
some people might have thought in, in it and uh, I should say for decades we type designers to put our emotions put our efforts on the consistency and the aesthetics on the outline drawings we're not gone, going to waste it we're going to inherit it and we summarize into another new model we give it more possibilities to play with and also it saves a lot of time when you are designing the the mass amount of the rarely used Chinese characters and to make uh, the more important thing is now we make the computers under the understand the characters just like we do we knew where the stroke is, is we knew how the strokes looks like and uh, we even places the contours just like the professional designers do so that's a very important uh, preparations for the next step of AI learning on the on the with real good quality text found. So I believe we are not opening the the Pandora's box, we are opening the box of hope. And yeah, thank you for Aperture Science for, for giving me the license for the box. And that's pretty much, that's it. And thank you very much.